Okay, this is the third lesson in the Bible Institute. And I'm doing this just to try and help people get interested in the Bible, help you learn the Bible. And if you'll do this, read the Bible every day, memorize Scripture, listen to the verse-by-verse -verse studies I'm putting on here. This can be the year of learning the Bible for you. You just get in the book and stay in the book. <clears throat> But so we've been talking about how there's a gap between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2, and it's an unknown period of time. We don't know exactly how much time passed in between those first two verses. Now, most Bible believers believe it's a couple thousand years, and that's what I believe, and that is speculation. But here is why most Bible believers believe that. You see, the Lord knows how many men are going to be, are going to willfully be saved and form the body of Christ, which is the church. The church is made up of every born again believer from the cross to the rapture. And the Lord is going to allow this age that we're in now to go on until that certain number is fulfilled. And then the rapture is going to happen. Now, if you, if, you, there's a certain number of people that's going to be saved. And God knows the last one that's going to be saved in the church age and is put into the body of Christ. At the rapture, the body of Christ is going to leave. And so people that, are, that get right in the tribulation, they're not going to be a part of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is already gone. You see, if people that, that were saved in the tribulation are put into the body of Christ then you've got the body of Christ going through the tribulation, you see. So, from the cross to the rapture, those who are saved become sons of God. When you believe on Jesus Christ today, you are a son of God. In John 1, 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now the angels and the cherubim, the seraphim and Lucifer, the angelic host, they are sons of God as well. Because remember in Job 38, 7, it called them sons of God and showed that they were here when God laid the foundations of the earth. Now possibly, possibly the Lord's plan for this age is to have billions of sons of God, billions of people who are saved, and they are going to replace the original sons of God that fell in the gap. And that's how the old guys used to always teach it. Just because they don't teach that now, that's how they always used to teach it. Every, everybody was teaching that a long time ago. Remember, we will be as the angels of God in heaven. Matthew twenty two thirty. You remember that verse? For in the resurrection they shall neither marry nor give it as marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Uh, no longer will we be made a little lower than the angels, as it talks about in Psalm 8, 5, because we're going to have glorified bodies that can do probably even more than the angels can do. And consider also how Paul says we are going to judge angels in 2 Corinthians 6, 3. So you got the replacement sons of God, us, judging the fallen sons of God. You see, when you put all these together, it starts to really make sense. And I mean, so this, is, this is just speculation. Still. And don't get so uptight that you can't speculate and wonder and just meditate and just sit and think about the Bible. Let it become entertaining. Let it become you know, a good mystery to you on things like this. You know, people like mystery stuff, mystery movies, mystery shows. Well, the Bible's got that too. It's got mystery in it. Don't be so uptight that you can't talk about this stuff. But from the cross, from Jesus down on the cross to the present time, has been around 2,000 years, right? And most likely the rapture is pretty close, right? Right? So if the church age is around 2,000 years long, 
then we could speculate that the gap in between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 is about 2,000 years long. And in Acts chapter 7, the Jews had their last opportunity of accepting Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They didn't. So the Lord postponed the kingdom and brought in this current church age. You see, if Israel had responded positively to Christ and the apostles, then the tribulation would have taken place back then, and then Jesus would have returned in the second coming seven years after his ascension in Acts chapter 1. And if that would have happened, we would need another 2,000 years to make the seven days of Genesis 1 through 2 match the timeline of history. You see, if they would have accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah back then, this 2,000 years that we, we've gone through right now in the church age wouldn't have happened. The tribulation would have happened back then, and you'd be short 2,000 years for each 1,000 years to match each day in the six days of creation. You see, it seems the six days of creation back in Genesis 1 through 2 matches the history of all history. Uh, with the seventh day, you remember on the seventh day, the Lord rested. That pictures the millennial rest where we're going to be at peace, at rest in the millennial reign for a thousand years. So Genesis chapter 1 through 2 refers to seven days. Six days of creation and that seventh day rest. And remember that the Lord sees a thousand years as one day. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. You got seven days spoken of in Genesis 1 and 2. And if a thousand years is as one day, then the, the most likely they're going to line up. You see, if Adam, Adam was here in about 4004 B.C., right? So he was here about 4,000 years before Jesus Christ. Before Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He was, it was about 4,000 years after Adam. And there's been 2,000 years since then, making 6,000 years. And then you will have another 1,000 years for the millennium, making 7,000 years. So you see how there's 7,000 years of time, right? Now, each 1,000 years would match a certain day in the creation week. And if the church age we currently are in never took place, if the Jews believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as a whole and they accepted him as the Messiah, the church age we're currently in would have never taken place. The tribulation would have happened back there around the time of the book of Acts, and you would be... 2,000 years short for history to match the seven days of Genesis 1 through 2. So the gap would have accounted for that 2,000 years, making it still match that time. However, now the church age took place. So this 2,000 years that we're in now would actually replace that 2,000-year gap, and we would replace the sons of God who fell. So once again, God had it worked out to where no matter what the Jews did with Jesus Christ, he had the 2,000 years accounted for, whether it was 2,000 years in the gap or replace that with 2,000 years in the church age. So that's why Bible believers believe there was a 2,000, it's just a 2,000 year gap, not billions of years, not God using millions and billions of years to make things evolve over time. No, it was nothing like that. So there was a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 where Lucifer and the sons of God inhabited the earth. They were sons of God. And when Adam and Eve came along, they were to replenish and replace those fallen sons of God. They also failed. Now, he's offering the free gift of salvation to everyone. You can be born again and replace an angel that fell. You aren't going to become an angel. At the rapture, you'll have a body fashioned like unto his glorious body, the Lord. 
So you'll be a little higher than the angels in that sense this time around. But the flood took place in between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 that left the earth without form and void. And this flood is spoken of in 2 Peter 3. In 2 Peter 3, 4, it says, In saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So this puts us, this puts the context before Noah's flood because Noah's flood wasn't in the beginning of the creation. So, 2 Peter 3, 5, For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. You see, in Noah's flood, the waters covered the earth, but it wasn't in the water. You wouldn't say that the earth was in the water. The waters were covering the earth. In Noah's flood, the earth was flooded. In Lucifer's flood, the universe was flooded, and the earth was in the water. It says, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Notice it said the world that then was. This would have been the creation of Genesis 1-1. After Genesis 1-2, when it was without form and void, he refashions it over again during the six days of creation. And you have the world, our present world. You see, the world didn't perish in Noah's flood. It was all flesh that perished. In 2 Peter 3, 7, it says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Notice the heavens and the earth, which are now, it says. You see, we still have the same one that Noah was on. Noah's flood was a flood to destroy all flesh. It didn't destroy the whole creation, like Lucifer's flood in between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. But this present world that we live in will be destroyed as well. However, this time around it's going to be by fire. It's reserved under fire. And then the Lord will create a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation 21. And it's going to go back and be like it was before sin came into the universe. Not before sin came into the world but before sin came into the universe, with nothing separating God from his creation. So I believe there were two different floods, Lucifer's flood in between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, Noah's flood that you'll see in Genesis 6 through 9. So with the gap of Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2 established, let's look at the sons of God who would have inhabited that space of time. And it wasn't a human race. It was like an angelic race. There was no humans before Adam. There was no evolution involved. There wasn't billions of years in there. Most likely it was like 2,000 years in that gap. But you see, um, don't go overboard with the teaching of the gap and make it a, a issue to where you say somebody's not a Bible believer if they don't believe the gap. If they don't believe in the gap, who cares? You know, if you don't believe in the gap, it doesn't bother me a bit. I don't, th uh, I don't make that a standard that you have to go by to be a Bible believer. I don't think that you're not right with God if you don't believe the gap. I don't think any of that stuff, I don't think anything bad about you if you don't believe the gap. Because, I mean, it's a kind of become a lost teaching in most places, so... For most people, it's hard to believe unless you really look into it. Like for me, I've always believed that there was a gap and I've, I've studied it on and off throughout the time I've been saved. But I never just came out and just really believed it was a fact until I just studied it this time. Like the more I studied on it, I studied on it for like a month. When I started making these, I started studying on it again. And I'm just really like, wow, this this is tr really a fact here. It's not just a theory. It's a fact. I've always believed it, but I was always like, man, maybe it is just a theory. 
But I really believe it is a fact now that it did actually happen. And it's not a new teaching at all. And if you're new to hearing this, this ain't just something I come up with. You know, all the old guys taught it. Schofield taught it. Larkin taught it. People way before that. And you can get a book by Michael Pearl called The Gap Fact and Out of Wax Scientism. And he goes back and shows you people believing it around the time of the apostles. Way back, a long time ago, was believing that something took place between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. If you look at the Schofield Reference Bible, if I'm not mistaken, in between those first two verses of the Bible, he's got something wrote down there that shows he believed in the gap. And obviously Ruckman, Hoffman, James Knox, all the all the Bible teachers that people have used over the years to learn the Bible, just about all of them believe in the gap. And in that book by Michael Pearl, he was talking about back in the fifties and sixties when he was a when he was just first starting in the ministry and stuff. He said you it was you would be you would have a hard time finding somebody that didn't believe in the gap. He said back then it was weird if you did didn't believe in it. Whereas now today it's weird if you do believe in it. You know, nobody nobody teaches it. Nobody really even knows about it. If you go into the average church and talk to this about the average Christian, they're going to think you're a crazy hippie or something. And I've had people tell me that before. When I start talking about this stuff, I start talking about the, the waters above the, um, above the second heaven, all that stuff like that. They look at you like you're crazy. I don't just go around talking about this to the average lost person you know, at work, because they already think I'm crazy, and this stuff is so foreign to even Christians. You know, this is something you talk about with Bible believers that's got an open mind that are just as crazy as you are. But that's the gap. Now we're going to look more into who was it that was here during that gap. Now, obviously, we know Lucifer was here, and he was a cherub. So let's look at the cherubim that would have been here during that gap. So I'm going to give you like a brief little introduction to the cherubim. Obviously names that you see in scripture, the cherubims, cherubs, how many? It looks like four. Doesn't mean that there can't be more, but it looks like there's just four of them. Formerly five, if you count the devil who fell. Their location, third heaven, primarily around God's throne. At one time, at least two of them were in the Garden of Eden. Uh, protect, uh, garden it at to where and somebody can't get in. Their spiritual condition is they're holy and without sin. Their job seems to be guardians. Their physical appearance, well, they've got four faces. The face of an ox, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, the face of a man. They've got four wings. They've got calves' feet. They've got the likeness of a man. And they've got a man's hand under their wings. The main verses you'll find, this isn't the only verses, but the main verses for them, Genesis 3.24 all of Ezekiel 1 and all of Ezekiel 10. You'll find all kinds of information on the cherubim to where you can go and look at it yourself. And these are really big creatures. You know, the uh, world portrays them as little bitty creatures, like some type of fairies or something, that are naked with wings. Kind of looks like little babies with wings. And if you are like me and you grew up in like the 90s, early 2000s and you went to your grandma's house, she would have these little angels, naked babies with wings, which is weird. But there was, those were called cherubs. But that looks nothing like the cherubs in the Bible. You see, that makes heaven and the Lord and his angelic host look very 
soft, and weak. And that's exactly what the devil wants. Part of this I'm going to show you is they are not soft and weak at all. They're actually really big creatures. And in 1 Kings 16.23, you know, Solomon's making the temple, right? And God's telling him how to do it, telling him, you know, he tells him what to put in there. And the cherub, the sculpted cherubs that he puts in there are 10 cubits high. And if a cubit is 18 inches, and you times that by 10, you got 180. Divide that by 12, you got 15 feet. So if the sculpted cherubs are the same size as the actual cherubs, then you got cherubs being about 15 feet high, 15 feet tall. Their wings in 1 Kings 16, 24 are five cubits long. So they're about seven and a half feet wide. In 1 Kings 6, 25 and 26, it says, And the other cherub was ten cubits. Both the cherubs were of one measure and one size. <coughs> the height of the one cherub was ten cubits, and so was it of the other cherub. So not a one is bigger than the other, just as the saints shouldn't see themselves as bigger than another saint. The cherubs are the same size. And there was one cherub, Lucifer, who obviously saw himself as bigger than everyone else. And he gets brought down to size, or he's going to eventually. One day he will be in the lowest of the low, the lake of fire. But the cherubs are big creatures. And Ezekiel chapter 1 gives great details on the cherubim as well. So if you look at Ezekiel chapter 1, it says in Ezekiel 1, 4, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. So a whirlwind. A whirlwind comes out of the north. Remember, that is where God is, according to Psalm 48, 2. Beautiful for situation the joy of the whole earth and the sides of the north, the city of the great king. The side, that's where God is, the sides of the north. That's where Lucifer wanted to exalt himself above. Is the, he, he said, I will exalt myself above the stars of God. I will sit also up on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He said, I'll be like the most high. So God's up there in the north. And a whirlwind comes out of the north. You know what a whirlwind is connected with in the Bible? It's connected to the second coming of Jesus Christ. When he comes back, he comes back with a whirlwind. When Elijah was caught up, what came down? A whirlwind. So there's some type of connection between a whirlwind and getting back and forth to the third heaven. So notice also there's a great cloud in Ezekiel 1.4. Clouds are also associated with Jesus Christ coming back at the second coming. Revelation 1, 7, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. Now, Ezekiel 1, 5, Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Now, here's your cherubim, and that's why I said there's, seems like there's four of them. Now, maybe there's more. Maybe the rest of them are up in the third heaven in the break room or something. I don't know, but this shows four. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. They have the likeness of a man, so they stand up on their feet just like a man would. Imagine that. Like I said, they're 15 feet high. Imagine one of them walking in your room and having to bend over because they can't fit in there. I mean, at 15 feet high, they would be looking down at Goliath. And their heads and shoulders above a lot of the giants. And Deuteronomy 3.11, it, talking about Og, king of Bashan, it says, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Raboth of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. So Og's bed... 
his bedstead of iron that's talking about here was about 13 and a half feet long. The cherub, if the cherub came over there for a sleepover, their feet would be hanging out of the, his bed. And that's a big bed. And their toes would get cold. That bed would be so small. You know, it would look like an NBA player trying to sleep in a toddler bed. If they slept in a giant's bed. So these are big creatures. They're not little uh, fairies or cute little babies. That is not at all what they are. The devil wants to make you think that all of God's stuff looks either weak, sissy, effeminate, or babyish. But that's what all his stuff looks like, actually. Well, his stuff don't look like that, but he, compared to God, he's a weak, sissy, and everything else. You know, the devil does not have more power than God. The devil has way more power than us. But he is nowhere near to the power of God. What he has is nowhere near to what God has. He may have a lot of angels. The Lord has way more. He have, may have a lot of power. The Lord has way more. It's no contest. But these cherubs, it says in Ezekiel 1, 6, And everyone had four faces. And everyone had four wings. So there's your four faces and your four wings. So you got like a regular head, but with a different face on each side of the head. So they have every angle covered. You know, you can't, you can't get anything by them. You know, all the angels in heaven would have said, you just can't get nothing by these guys. I mean, they got eyes on the back of their head. You know, Michael and Gabriel couldn't talk behind their back. Uh, you couldn't throw them a surprise party. They're the ultimate security guard. You can't get anything past them. No matter where they're standing, they'll see you. And perhaps this is why he had them guarding the garden after the fall. In Genesis 3.24, it says, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, they're the ultimate security guard. And since the cherub have four faces and four wings... And since Lucifer is the anointed cherub, it makes sense that he would have, maybe still has in some some way, have four faces and four wings. But at one time, he most likely did have that if he doesn't anymore. You see, Lucifer was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And it wouldn't be far-fetched to say the other cherubs are also full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Maybe to a lesser extent than he was, but it wouldn't be far-fetched to say that. It says in Ezekiel 1, 7, And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. So if they sparkle like the color of burnished brass, burnished means polished, so then, it, so then it's, it's like someone rubbed them until they were really shiny. So they're real shiny, sparkly. They also have the sole of a calf's foot. Maybe this is why they call the devil Old Split Foot. Maybe that's why you see on Guitar Hero, the game Guitar Hero, everybody used to play, the devil on it has Split Foot, but he's got the likeness of a man. Just like the cherubs. Most likely this is why the Baphomet used by the Satanists has the likeness of a man and hooves. And this is one reason why the Lord said to the devil, said the devil was cursed above all cattle in Genesis 3.14. Now you go to Ezekiel 1.8, it says, And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. So there are four remaining cherubs, it looks like, and Lucifer was the fifth, and he fell. Five's the number of death. Devil's got five letters. Satan's got five letters. He falls five times. But they got the hands of a man under their wings. And every saint should have the hands of a man. What does it talk about in 1 Thessalonians 4.11? And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. You can learn a lot from these cherubs. They got the hands of a man. Do you have the hands of a man? Are you working with your own hands? That's having the hands of a man. 
Ezekiel 1 9, their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. So they seemed to be in, in sync, completely in sync, like the saints should be. In Philippians 2 2, it says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So the saints should be in sync, just like the cherubs are. And you see, they all go straight forward. Says the cherubs all go straight forward. And in Philippians 3.14, Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You need to be pressing forward. Now, Ezekiel 1.10. Ezekiel 1.10, As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. Okay, picture this. The four faces are of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. The class that's missing is the reptilian class, the aquatic class. And with Lucifer gone, he would probably have represented the reptilian class. What is he now? He's called a dragon. He's called a serpent. He probably would have represented that class. Now turn to Ezekiel chapter 10, and we will see another description of the cherub's faces. In Ezekiel 10, 14, it says, And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, and the second face was the face of a man, and the third face, the face of a lion, and the fourth, the face of an eagle. So notice the only difference from chapter 1 is that they is that the face of an ox is replaced with the face of a cherub. So this has led many to believe that the cherub's face is the face of an ox. Their regular face is the face of an ox. That's the face of a cherub. That's what, that's what many people believe. And this is why when people in the Bible wanted to make a god, they would many times make a golden calf. You see, the devil at one point at least had a calf's foot and the face of an ox. So no wonder people go around saying, Holy cow. And they made a golden calf. And one of the cherub's faces is also the face of a lion. It says in Ezekiel 1.10, Compare that with 1 Peter 5.8, where the devil's called a roaring lion. You see, he's a cherub. He would have had at one time the face of a lion. No wonder he's called a roaring lion. The cherubs also have the face of an eagle. And you'll find that devils in the Bible are many times referred to as winged creatures. And the devil himself is like a fowl that swoops down and takes the word out of your heart, as the Lord talks about. It says in Ezekiel 111, Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. So their wings are stretched upward. And this could picture how the saint needs to stay in prayer. In 1 Timothy 2.8 it says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So their, hands were, their wings were stretched upward. Two wings covered their bodies as well. The saint should have his shield of faith on. Ephesians 6.16 The cherubs could be uh, covering their bodies out of respect for the Lord as well. Ezekiel one twelve it says, And they went every one straight forward, whether the Spirit was to go they went, and they turned not when they went. So they turned not when they went. You could compare this with how you need to stay on a straight path and not stray off into sin. In, in Proverbs 4.26-27, it says, Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established, Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy feet from evil. So the movement of the cherub pictures how you need to move. Turn not to the right hand or the left. Go on the straight and narrow way. In Proverbs 4.26 it says, Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. 
In Ezekiel 1, 13, it says, As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Notice where it says, As the appearance of lamps. There are seven lamps of fire burning before the throne in Revelation 4, 5. Cherubs hang around the throne. And as a saint, we should stay around God's throne, just like the cherubs. In Hebrews 4, 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How do you hang around the throne? You stay in prayer. And when you got saved, you're already sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're hanging around the throne in that sense. Ephesians 1.14, And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. If Lucifer was a cherub, then he's fast as lightning. Maybe he can't be everywhere at once, but he runs and returns as a flash of lightning to and fro in the earth. It says in Luke 10.18, Jesus said, And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So notice that lightning. Lucifer's connected with it. The cherub's connected with it. And notice that lightning is around the throne of God in Revelation 4, 5, even. Ezekiel 10, 1, it says, Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of, a, of the likeness of a throne. So once again, we see that the cherubs carry God's throne. And they are under the throne and not trying to exalt themselves above the Most High on that throne. Make sure that in all things that you give the Lord the preeminence. They're powerful creatures. Way more powerful than us. Way more holy than us. And they're not trying to exalt themselves above God. They got God on top of them, ahead of them. The Bible talks about uh, this machine type thing that's in connection with these cherubs. And it actually becomes alive when they join up with it. This is some really weird verses in Ezekiel 1, 15 through 20. It says, Now as I beheld the living creatures, which would be the cherubim, now it's going to talk about this machine. It says, Behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like the unto the color of a barrel and they four had one likeness and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel so i guess picture a wheel in the middle of a wheel and when they went they went up on their four sides and they turned not when they went and as for their wings they were so high that they were dreadful and their rings were full of eyes round about them four so you see this full of eyes. Picture that. All these eyes. Now you might that might terrify you if you've seen it right now without a glorified body. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. So the wheels are doing what they're doing. It says, Whether whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Tither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So the wheels are doing what the spirit of, of the cherub does. So this machine is powered by the spirit of the cherubs. It says in Ezekiel 121, And when those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So the cherubs are hooked up with each other. And to this machine that comes alive when they connect to it. It's a really wild scene that you really can't imagine or describe. But above them is a firmament with God thrown on top of it. So what you what what God has here is like a a machine connected to these cherubs, and that's his that's like a transportation for his throne. Does he need that? Does he need transportation? No, he could just float around if he wanted to, but what's the fun in that? You see, in Ezekiel 1, 22 through 23, and the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color 
of the terrible crystal, stretch forth over their heads above. And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Every one had two which covered on this side, and every one had two which covered on that side their bodies. So this covering of the bodies could be out of respect for being in the presence of God. For example, when John sees the Lord in Revelation chapter 1, he falls on his face. He falls at his feet as dead. Ezekiel 124, When they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. You see, the noise of their wings sounds like the voice of God, like great waters. And Revelation 1.15 talks about the Lord has the voice, his voice is as the sound of many waters. And just like the cherubs, you see when the cherubs move, you hear that, that sound of many waters. They sound like the voice of God. They've been hanging around so, God so much, they start sounding like him. When you move through this life, you should remind everybody of the voice of God. You need to be around God so much in the Bible and in prayer that when you move, people see God. People hear God coming out of your mouth. When you speak, you need to speak as the oracles of God. Ezekiel 1, 25 through 26. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. So there's the Lord. He's the one on the throne that they're carrying around. Ezekiel 1, 27 through 28, and I, saw, and I saw as it as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell up on my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. This sounds a lot like Revelation 4. In Revelation 4, 2 and 3, it says, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. So the cherubs, their main job involves this throne of God, it seems. And we read more about them in Ezekiel chapter 10. And this is where Ezekiel reveals that the creatures he saw by the river of Kibar was the cherubims. In Ezekiel 10, 20 through 22, he shows you that the, the, cre the four living creatures he saw by the river of Kibar in Ezekiel chapter 1 is the cherubs. Ezekiel 10, 20 through 22, it says, This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Kibar. And I knew that they were the cherubims. Everyone had four faces apiece, and everyone had four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings, and the likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river of Kibar. Their appearance and themselves, they went everyone straight forward. So, that's the cherubs. Probably the weirdest creatures in the Bible. But that's what you would have had. That's part of what was here during in between those first, first two verses of the Bible. And something interesting is God's still using those creatures today. Now the next one is the seraphim. Now here is a brief description of the seraphim. The name, obviously seraphim. How many? Looks like four. Once again, it looks like there's four of them. Their spiritual state, holy and sinless. Their job, whereas the cherubim were, their job had to do with the throne of God. The seraphim, their job seems to have to do with the altar of God. Their appearance, they have six wings, unlike the cherub who have four wings. And they got the face of a calf 
face of a lion, face of a man, face of an eagle. It doesn't say that they have four faces like the cherubs. But the main verses, you'll find Ezekiel 6, you'll, I mean, not Ezekiel, Isaiah 6, 1 through 7, is where you'll find the seraphim. And I personally believe in Revelation 4, 6 through 8, that that's talking about the seraphim as well and not the cherubim. Most people, all the great Bible teachers have it, that that's the cherubim in Revelation 4. So I wouldn't argue with you either way. But if you pin me down on it, I would say it was the seraphim in Revelation 4. And that's where I got that they got the face of a calf, a lion, and an eagle. But the seraphims are a, a whole other class of heavenly beings. I believe these are different classes of, of heavenly beings. It says in Ezekiel, uh, or not Ezekiel, but Isaiah 6, 1 through 3, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You will quickly notice that the seraphim have six wings, unlike the cherubim who have four wings. The seraphims have two which covered their face, two which covered their feet, and then two to fly. Notice the words they speak is holy, holy, holy. And this is directed to God on his throne. And the four beasts in Revelation 4 seem to match the seraphim of Isaiah chapter 6 because they both have six wings. And since the Bible is a book of patterns, it mentions their six wings in Isaiah 6. It mentions these four beasts in Revelation 4 having six wings. And the fact that they both say, Holy, 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 in both places, sets the pattern for us. Now, obviously, everybody in heaven most likely is going to be saying, Holy, holy, holy. But still, it put that together with, with these creatures having the six wings and saying those same words. Seems like it's showing you a pattern there. Revelation 4, 6 through 8 says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. Now you also seen that full of eyes associated with the cherubs. But it says, And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Now you see, that's, that's different than what we saw with the cherubim because it's not saying that they got four faces here in Revelation 4 like the cherub do. It's just saying they had, one of them has a face of a lion. One of them had the face of a calf. One of them had the, the, the third beast had the face of a man. The fourth beast had the face of a flying eagle. doesn't say they got four faces. Now you could speculate and say that he was only he on, that's just the only ones that John saw. Like he just didn't see the other parts of their faces. Which, I mean, that could be true, but that's that's not what it says, though. And surely, if you was looking at one, and you saw that it had the face, and you was just looking at one of their faces straight up, and you saw it had the face of an eagle, you'd probably still be able to see the face, the other faces poking out on the sides, too. So, to me, it seems like if they had more than one face like the cherub, then John would probably describe that here. But then it says in, in, in verse 8, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. So, the cherub had four wings in, Revelation, or in Ezekiel 1. If this is cherubim, why, why do they have six wings here? They wouldn't just grow two more wings. So, why call it cherubim? Who have when they got four wings, when you got the seraphim who actually do have six wings. So each one of them had six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. That's the thing that's what the that's what the seraphim said in Ezekiel six three. And it says, and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. So you see, obviously everybody's going to be saying that, but 
it links it together by talking about six wings and holy, holy, holy in both places. So if you go with the consistency of the Bible, I think that's the most consistent way to look at it. Compare Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4. Compare Revelation 4 and Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10. Looks more like seraphim to me than the cherubim. But I wouldn't argue with you either way. If you want to believe it's cherubim, that's, that's no problem. But they rest not day and night, it says. You see, one day me and you were going to be in glorified bodies. And we're not going to have to rest day or night. Notice the word holy is repeated three times. This reminds you of the Godhead, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Holy, holy, holy. And the seraphims worship a triune God, just like us. One God manifested in three. One and three, and three and one, three and one, and one and three, the one in the middle died for me. Just like that old saying goes. Isaiah 6, 4 through 5 says, And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See what happened to Isaiah when he got around the throne? He saw the throne and he realized how dirty he was. He realized he was undone. Then he admitted, I am a man of unclean lips. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. So they, the seraphim seemed to have more to do with the altar. The cherubim have more to do with the throne. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips. And thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So seraphims, like the cherubims, can also fly. These are powerful beings. And looking at the spirit world will remind you that in your flesh you are weak. Don't ever try to put confidence in your flesh. It was made a little lower than the angels. However, there's something in you that's holy, and that will eventually judge angels, the ones that fail, and that is the new man which you received at salvation that's going to judge angels. Something interesting to note also is that the seraphims could interact and talk with people. These are in both the cherubim and the seraphim, both intelligent creatures. I mean, obviously, if Lucifer was a cherub, he was full of wisdom, perfect, and beauty. So imagine, most likely the cherubs are also full of wisdom. But that was the cherubim and the seraphim, the creatures that would have been here when God laid the foundations of the earth and was in that gap of Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. And then next time we'll talk about the angels that was here as well.